Hey guys, I'm Angelo, producer of They Will Kill You, and I hope you enjoyed today's special episode done in collaboration with All Time Conspiracies. It's a really exciting episode about British hostages locked up abroad, so I hope you enjoy it. Number 7. Lindsay Sandyford Indonesia is a country with very harsh drug laws, where the act of carrying and selling drugs is punishable by extensive jail sentences or even death. Between 2015 and 2016, at least 10 foreigners were executed by a firing squad for drug-related crimes. Currently, Lindsay Sandyford, a British grandmother over 60 years of age, is on death row in Bali Island's Karobakan prison. Lindsay arrived in Bali from Bangkok in 2012, and a routine search at the airport uncovered cocaine stashed in her luggage. Under police interrogation, she claimed that gangsters forced her into drug trafficking over threats against her family. She subsequently took part in a sting operation to arrest several other alleged drug traffickers in Indonesia. In 2013, an Indonesian court sentenced Lindsay to death by firing squad. This came as a shock, as even her prosecutors did not recommend the death penalty for her since she had been willing to cooperate with investigators. By contrast, others involved in the case only received custodial sentences. Appeals were made, but with Indonesia taking a tough stance against drug smugglers, Lindsay Sandyford remains a death row inmate in Bali's Karobakan prison. Number 6. Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe Holding citizenship of a first world country is considered a privilege by many. But for those originating from a country like Iran, those who obtain Western citizenship are constantly viewed with suspicion by their native country's government. In recent years, several dual nationals originating from Iran have been imprisoned in their motherland over accusations of undermining national security. This includes Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, a British-Iranian dual citizen who is currently behind bars for unspecific charges. As she was about to board her flight back to the UK, she was arrested at the airport and taken to our unknown prison 600 miles from the capital of Tehran. Her daughter's British passport was seized, forcing the toddler to remain in the country under her grandparents' care. In September of 2016, an Iranian court sentenced Nazanin to five years in jail over unspecified security offences. According to Iran's state news agency, Nazanin is accused of attempting to soft-topple the Iranian government by being involved in anti-government protests following the disputed 2009 presidential election. Amnesty International suggests that Nazanin, who was a former BBC employee, was linked to a BBC training program for Iranian journalists. These same journalists were punished upon their return to Iran in 2014. Her husband, Richard, has launched an online petition urging the British and Iranian governments to take appropriate actions in securing the safe release and return of his wife and daughter, and has garnered nearly 1 million signatories worldwide. Number 5. Mohammed Asghar Blasphemy laws are said to be made to protect religious beliefs, with punishments ranging from local restrictions and fines to even death. But due to its vagueness, such laws are prone to abuse and seriously limit freedom of speech. In the case of Mohammed Asghar, the Pakistani court that convicted him did not even consider the fact that his alleged blasphemous actions were influenced by his mental illness. The pensioner had left Edinburgh for Pakistan in 2010, shortly after being discharged from the capital's Royal Victoria Hospital, where he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He was arrested that same year by Pakistani authorities under allegations of writing letters claiming to be the Prophet Muhammad. Despite appeals by medical professionals, Asghar was given a death sentence in January 2014. While incarcerated at Rawal Pindi's Adiala prison, an assassination attempt was made on Asghar's life by a prison guard who shot him in the back. He has reportedly been moved to a more secure location and is in an isolated and windowless room, but is in poor health and is said to have lost his sight. Asghar's plight has been highlighted in the House of Commons in the UK, with over 70,000 people signing a petition calling for his release. But despite talks being made with the Pakistani government, Asghar is still being held as a death row inmate. His family and representatives in Scotland have criticised the British government, claiming they would have put more effort into his release had he been a white man. Number 4. Linda Carty Born in the Caribbean island of St Kitts in the 1950s, Linda Carty became a British citizen as St Kitts was a British colony back then. She later immigrated to the United States with her parents, studied pharmacology, and at one time worked undercover for the DEA, infiltrating Colombian and Caribbean gangs. 
In 2002, Linda was convicted of organizing the kidnap and murder of her 25-year-old neighbor, Joanna Rodriguez, and the kidnapping of Rodriguez's son. Police found the body of the female victim in the trunk of Linda's car, while the live baby was found in another car, also owned by Linda. According to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, three men had invaded Rodriguez's home in Houston, presumably on Linda's behalf. The victim was tied up, had a bag placed over her head, and placed in the trunk of a car, where she died from suffocation. Her toddler son, on the other hand, was taken alive. Linda was sentenced to death by lethal injection, although she maintains her innocence. She claims that she was framed by people seeking revenge for her previous work as an informant for the DEA. The US has also been criticized for failing to immediately inform the UK's consular officials about Linda's detention. This breach in international law, according to a UK diplomat in Houston at the time, made a big difference in the outcome of the case, as British officials were unable to provide support until it was too late. By that point, the verdict had already been made. Linda is currently awaiting her death sentence. Her latest appeal in 2016 was rejected, where her lawyers claimed to have unearthed evidence that prosecutors were coercing witnesses into giving false statements at her trial. Linda Carty's case received media attention in the UK when her supporters placed an image of her on the fourth plinth of Trafalgar Square. Her case is covered widely and has been the subject of various documentary TV shows. Number 3. Andagachu Siege Ethiopia's ruling government has a long list of violations when it comes to human rights records. The regime is known for imprisoning opposition party members and is responsible for the mass killings of protesters on several occasions. For years, Ethiopian British politician Andagachu Siege has been speaking out against the injustices and corruption plaguing his native country, earning him the nickname Ethiopian Mandela. In 2009, Siege was sentenced to death in absentia by the Ethiopian court on allegations of plotting a coup and planning to murder government officials. He was safe, however, as he remained in the UK where he was naturalized as a citizen many years ago, but not for long. On June 23, 2014, the outspoken critic was in transit at Yemen's Sana International Airport heading from the United Arab Emirates to Eritrea. There, he was suddenly detained by Yemeni security forces who were in cohorts with Ethiopian intelligence. Siege was taken to an unknown location, and both Yemeni and Ethiopian governments released no official statements concerning his whereabouts. He appeared two weeks later in Ethiopia, where he was paraded on TV as a criminal. There are concerns over Siege being tortured in jail, and the British government's political inaction over Ethiopia's illegal rendition of Siege has been widely criticized. In 2015, a series of leaked emails revealed that the British Foreign Secretary had blocked diplomatic actions to bring Siege home, and in 2016, the UK's High Court ruled that the Foreign Office did not have to intervene on the issue. Number 2. Krishna Maharaj Krishna Maharaj is a British Indo-Caribbean businessman who once enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle. He mingled with the rich and famous, owned numerous fancy cars and racehorses, and gave a lot to charity. But over 30 years ago, he was unjustly convicted for a double homicide in the United States and has been behind bars ever since. He has always maintained his innocence, and according to human rights organizations, Krishna's case is one epic miscarriage of justice. In the summer of 1986, Chinese Jamaican businessman Derek Mu Young and his adult son Duan were found dead in the DuPont Plaza Hotel in Miami, Florida. Krishna was apprehended as a suspect as the Mu Youngs owed him money following a property deal. Krishna had also been in the same hotel room as them following an earlier meeting, so his fingerprints were there. But despite his solid alibi of being 30 miles away from the scene during the time of the murders, Krishna was convicted. He was initially given the death sentence, which was overturned and switched to life imprisonment 10 years later. Countless appeals have been made over the past three decades, but to no avail. It is widely believed that the father and son were actually murdered by a hitman under the orders of the late Colombian drug lord Pablo Escobar, who the two victims also owed money to. According to British lawyer Clive Stafford-Smith, who has been championing Krishna's case for years, the facts have been confirmed through his many meetings with the Escobar's Medellin cartel. In April 2017, the American court gave the decisive ruling based on recently discovered evidence that a new hearing of the case would be granted. But whatever the results of the hearing will be, nothing could compensate for the 30 years that Krishna has been lost behind bars. Number 1. John Cantley John Cantley is a British war photojournalist known for having been abducted twice by armed militants in Syria. He is currently still being held captive by ISIS and has been used repeatedly by the terrorist organization in their propaganda videos. 
John's troubles began in July of 2012, almost immediately as soon as he entered Syria as a freelance war correspondent. He was reportedly captured by unidentified armed fighters after illegally crossing Turkey's border. He attempted to escape but got shot in the left arm, causing him to later suffer ulnar nerve entrapment. Fortunately, he was saved by the Free Syrian Army a week after being kidnapped and was smuggled back across the border. John's first ordeal, however, was not enough to make him give up on covering Syria. He entered the war-stricken country again that year and in November 2012 was revealed to have been abducted for a second time alongside American journalist James Foley. They were captured by Northern militants who then sold them to ISIS. Foley was beheaded sometime later, while John, after having disappeared for almost two years, appeared in an online video in 2014 posted by ISIS. It was the first episode of what would become a propaganda series made by the terrorist group, where John was featured in an orange prison garb criticizing Western foreign policy. Approaching five years of being held captive, John has been exploited in at least 14 ISIS propaganda videos, looking paler and thinner each time. Besides John Candley, it is believed that there are at least another 20 journalists and media contributors from around the world currently being held hostage by ISIS. The dark net is home to many illegal activities. Child pornography, live torture streams and hitmen for hire are all accessible on black market websites. Perhaps most famous and first of all these was Silk Road, 